You are now tuned in to the Property Management Show with your host, Alex Osinenko. We bring in the experts of today so you can be the master of tomorrow in all things property management. Whether it's getting more doors, running a profitable fee-based business, or by simply being the best property manager. So, grab a pen and paper because this episode is sure to be a good one. Thank you and enjoy the show. Welcome to another episode of the Property Management Show. It's great to have you here. Uh, today, I'm going to be answering your questions. Now, we've uh, been on the air for about two years. I have uh, had a lot of feedback from uh, listeners over this time and um, had a lot of questions along the way. So I was kind of just helping people out, answering one-off questions here and there. But, you know, I've decided to create a segment and... Um, uh, that specifically has to do with taking my uh, experience and expertise and pointing towards um, helping you address your specific questions. Now, just a quick background. I spent the uh, last 10 years in the property management industry and the last six as an entrepreneur and business owner scaling four and a half from you know zero kind of a garage days to... 27 employees and growing fast at this stage. So um, coming in with this experience on both sides and having spoken with thousands of property management companies, many, many of them very, very successful, uh, a good number of them failed. Um, and there's a whole uh, uh, section in the middle who are just kind of trying to figure things out. Um, well, um, one thing I have to say that... Um, um, my purpose in, in life and my professional purpose in life has always been to help small businesses grow. This is my passion. This is what I do. And uh, this podcast is certainly a part of that, um, fulfilling that purpose. So I really, really enjoy this. And I want to say thank you very much for listening and submitting your questions. So let's go ahead and start with question number one. This one comes from Sam uh, in Longmont, Colorado. And here's what Sam writes. I started about four and a half years ago with a couple of properties that took over that I took over from another property manager who was getting out of the business. I got into the business because I wanted something um, a little more stable than just selling real estate. Well, we are now at 85 properties. Good job, Sam. Um, mostly higher quality uh, uh, single family homes and townhomes. Uh, currently, we're growing at 30% for the last two years and I'm struggling with how to best structure my business. This is a great question. And by the way, props on 30% growth. That, that is really good, Sam. Uh, he, Sam continues, I started out doing everything uh, myself, sales, accounting, inspections, maintenance, of course, as a single founder, you gotta do wear all these hats. And two years ago, I was up to 40 properties and then I realized that I need to make a change. So now uh, Sam hired two I'm just going to kind of summarize the rest of it. Sam hired two uh, folks who are, one of them is helping him uh, with maintenance. The other one is helping with uh, showing um, his available rentals. So here's the question, right? Sam writes, my concern is as we continue to grow, how to best adjust this system with increased business when the spring summer rush starts. Just keep, just keep it the same and bring in a couple of showing agents or change back to portfolio style and have a separate admin position? So that is a very good question. Um, I think the growth part is phenomenal, Sam, so that's good, congrats on that. Now as far as structuring your operations, I have a very specific advice for you. I thought this through and um, I think you, you're, per, you're in a perfect position to implement and continue scaling your company, if you choose to, with a squad structure. Um, what that means is you have a property management executive on top who is responsible for speaking to all the clients. Any kind of client interactions, your PM executive is the one to take that on. Below the PM executive, there is a uh, maintenance support 
there is a uh, um, uh, rentals and, and leasing support, right? And then you might have an accounting, part-time accountant support. And so that squad as a structure operates uh, most efficiently because you have a single point of contact for your clients. And as a squad, you should be able to handle, as Adam Hooley says, um, who's the person I interviewed on this structure, um, he says it should be handled anywhere from 150 to, to up to 300 properties, a properly organized squad. So as a business ourselves, as a service delivery business, and um, four and a half is very similarly structured to a lot of property management companies, um, we've converted into squads uh, about six months ago, and that has been in a, 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 a painful transition initially, but we're finding this a lot more efficient and effective for our clients and our ability to deliver work and provide a progression path for the team as well as they start at the sort of lower level and uh, uh, build their careers up to the high level. We call them campaign director. Um, I recommend you call them property management executive or PM executive. Um, so that would, that would be the path I would take. So I would highly recommend, Sam, you take the time um, to spend a day or spend a half a day uh, reviewing and listening to the framework of high performing, uh, five, uh, excuse me, the framework of high performance uh, property management team with Adam Hooley. I've done that interview a little while ago. It's on fourandhalf.com. If you click po- uh, free resources podcast, scroll down, you'll find uh, my interview with Adam Hooley. And in that interview, he cites a book that you can download, ebook that you can download for free and you can really dig in and understand. I read that book twice to understand the, the squad structure part to understand before we convert it. So I think my answer to you is, um, I think my path, at least your path in my, my view is pretty clear. You put that squad stru- structure together and you start filling out with properties. And then once you're ready to build a, a second squad, then you already have a framework for that. So that would be, my um, recommendation. All right, um, next question, very interesting. It's a longer question. I'm just gonna go ahead and read it. And this is gonna be, I think, very, very entertaining and a uh, useful listen for everyone involved. And by the way, this question comes from Monty from Florida. He's, uh, I've known Monty for, for a long time now, since five years or something. And here's Monty's question. Here we go. Okay, this is he writes this. Okay, I have owned stock and commodity investment firms for the last 25 years and utilized phone, telephone, cold calling as our main tool for generating leads at a low cost per acquisition. I had two branch offices in two states with 25 to 30 salespeople, with 12 to 15 full time telephone cold callers on the phone, pounding through thousands of leads daily to generate leads for my closers. The Dodd-Frank bill eliminated the trading platform um, that we had developed in 2011 and since I had myself been a real estate investor. Then I discovered property management and thought it was a good fit. I've been helping investors get better returns on their investments with stock and commodities for 25 years, so this was not much different in that sense. When I first got into the property management business, it was just me and my wife testing out to see if we'd even like it. So I started with some old property management leads, uh, then added some radio and hired you guys to handle my internet marketing. I've recently hired one of my old commodity brokers to start cold calling. We have had some initial success with that, but so far most have been tenant placement only accounts. Some are managed and we hope to convert those placements only, DIY owners into management accounts in the future, but time will tell. Okay. Monty continues to write. So I know that through my career um, that I'm one of the best salesmen and closers out there and I'm good at hiring and training my guys to follow my sales procedure with similar results. We close as much as 30% of our inbound leads and average minimum of 15 to 20% closing rate. We beat out competition who are cheaper than us and have built a good online reputation. The main thing holding us back Uh, from much faster, more explosive growth is more leads. I see companies like Empire, Steve Rosenberg, um, out of Houston that claim to have built zero to 700 doors in four to five years. Or Larson Property Management, Brett Larson, uh, who's now Rentworks, by the way, 
uh, in Austin claims to be adding a door a day. I also see some of these guys that are always doing interviews and podcasts. I don't know why these guys spend so much time getting their face out to other PM companies or how, if, if at all, it helps them generate owner leads, but if their numbers are true, it's pretty impressive. I have a hard time generating 40 to 50 leads a month, let alone 30 doors. This November, we only generated 12 inbound leads and no radio. I'm just curious what they are doing differently to generate that many leads. I spent $15,000 on radio alone last March, plus my internet marketing, um, and we will only generate 60 leads that month. I'd love to know what the marketing budget for those guys and what they are spending it on to get those results. Do you have any other suggestions um, that could help me hit those types of numbers? Wow, Monty, that's number one, excellent question, and thank you for writing this all out. Um, I think just about everyone on uh, who listens to the show are impressed with that sort of growth. Um, uh, what the companies men uh, Monty mentioned, which is uh, um, Empire Industries, was uh, with Steve Rosenberg at, at its helm and Pete, his partner, as well as Larson Properties, which is now RentWorks. And uh, firstly, I would say, to my best knowledge, having pretty intimate relationships and far as friendships with both of these uh, individuals, I think those numbers are quite uh, quite real and they are true. So their growth is 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 staggering and it's uh, and they're not backed by any sort of uh, uh, institutional money that I know of, right? So let's dig in and understand. I think there's two sides. So the question is to sum this up again. The question is, how can I get the same numbers as um, same same growth rate as do these two companies that I mentioned? Well, um, two uh, avenues here, two ways to think about it, and two things that you have to do, two different uh, directions. One is internal, the other one is external. So let's explore the internal. Over, over the years, I've come up with uh, three pillars for business success. Um, to succeed in business, um, the three things are purpose, numbers, and experimentation. So let me explain. The purpose uh, of the organization isn't to enrich its founder, right? Uh, because that's that's sort of that should be the outcome. That should not be the purpose. So the purpose of of, of the organization needs to be higher and something that um, people can can connect to and belong to, right? This is not rah rah stuff, right? That 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 you can hear on some of these retreats with some high end coaches. This is reality. People want to be uh, want to belong to something higher than themselves, right? Think about the Maslow hierarchy of needs, right? Once you you pay them and you know they're safe and they're secure, their job is good. You know the next thing, the, the real to elevate their thinking, people need to belong to a purpose and sort of feel like they're a team and they can do it, do this together. Let's examine both Brad's and Steve's purpose. These guys are so loud and clear about what are they doing, where are they going as a company, about leading this industry, right? That their teams are completely aligned behind that particular purpose. Each one of them have their own purpose, but it's very clear, it's crisp, they keep talking about it, they have values, they're, they're, they're truly sort of, um, they're truly aligned behind the same purpose. So I think purpose is definitely a check mark for both of these guys. The second thing is numbers. And when I say numbers, meaning that you have to understand everything about your business numbers wise. You need to know your numbers. This is key. For example, um, Steve's team, Steve and Pete with Empire Industries, they obsess about KPIs, right? So their marketing, um, I think he got promoted, uh, Kevin, their marketing guy. I mean, he, he spends, I think, a good number of his time just pulling data together to present the KPI to uh, the, uh, the business managers, to Steve and Pete, and so they can all together make decisions about a direction the company needs to take. So running the numbers and knowing your numbers on both pre-sale and post-sale front, right? The pre-sale, what I mean is um, 
before you bring a customer in, there's tons of different things need to happen. Um, and then once you sign a customer, that's post-sale. So the pre-sale is all the activities that have to, that your company has to take, uh, has to participate in and has to uh, enable to sign a customer. So you have to have, uh, you have to be obsessed about your KPIs on both pre-sale and post-sale sale fronts. The last piece of the success principles for me is the experimentation. Now, both of these companies are exceptional at experimenting. Let me just tell you a story. Okay, Steve Rosenberg specifically, he's a pilot, and uh, we've, uh, Steve and I crossed paths maybe, you know, 15 times throughout the last four, four, four or five years um, as he was flying to just about every NARPUM conference out there, any kind of conference out there. And, and he is, I remember him and I, we spent hours hours literally hours when everybody went to sleep all we did was sit down and and steve just interrogated me and and i interrogated him back about you know marketing growth you know what can they do why why are all these things that they're doing are not coming together yet you know it, this was a constant over the period of period of two years we had these deep conversations i completely enjoyed them in fact i missed those conversations um as it it really re required deep thinking about every single aspect of growth, marketing, structure, and position in your company to scale. And so we've had um, probably seven or eight of those discussions. I'm talking three, you know, up to three hours each, right? Um, Brad is the same way. Brad runs his own podcast. He interviews other property management companies. He continues to obsess about finding better ways to do things. You think he's on top and he's sitting there just enjoying himself? Absolutely not. He is the, one of the top thinkers in this industry. So experiment. the culture of experimentation starts with the owner, right? And it trickles down into the organization. Um, but more importantly, you have to have resources, not more importantly, but it's also important to have resources to be able to fund those kinds of experiments, right? And if you think about Renters Warehouse, right, just that example, I just, that's my recent interview with the CEO of Renters Warehouse, um, they spend 25% of revenue on marketing, okay, to scale up the business. They don't spend that much anymore, but they have initially to be able to scale their business to bring it to a level where it's at right now, okay? I'm not advocating any sort of crazy numbers like that, but as a business owner, here's what I found, right? I found a lot of business or small business owners specifically run sort of like this, this semi-personal checkbook out of their business, right? So you run your personal expenses through the business, you just, you, 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 you fork uh, all the profit out of the business into other ventures or your your own uh, pocket or or however you know you use that money, but it's not going back into the business growth. And then people sit and think, oh, um, boy, what's uh, why aren't we why aren't we moving as fast as we should be? You know, um, well, it's because you have to invest in growth, right? So, you know, and, and I'm I'm following my own example here, right? And and I mentioned this before, I have not taken a dollar of profit from my company for the last six years of existence. And trust me, I could have, right? It go, it's going right back into the growth because we have a purpose, we have a mission. And again, the personal enrichment should be the outcome, not the, not the goal, right? So scrap the Mickey Mouse accounting, right? And run your organization as, a, as its own entity, right? As something that will outlive you or you can package and sell for millions of dollars in the future, right? But I think it needs to be crystal clear, guys. And I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure this is a difficult admission to make as a business owner that a lot of things that you do really are not have anything to do with the company. The cars you buy, the uh, the jewelry you purchase, the trips you take, all these other things. Right, okay, well, we all want to save uh, money and not pay taxes, and technically this could potentially be part of the business expense, but you know it's not. You know it's not. Ask your CPA, right, how to run a business. So, you know, I, I would say this. Um, if you are looking to grow, you need to have a consistent strategic budget allocated to marketing and growth, and that should be 10% of your revenue, more or less, depending on how aggressive you want to grow and what kind of sort of operations structure you can deliver to support the growth, okay? But 
uh, Monty, going back to your question, so I, I went a little bit of a tangent. So let's imagine um, you've done, you said you've done, uh, uh, done $15,000 in radio last November. Well, so that's all good, but what happened if you would put $15,000 every month in radio since November for 12 months? Right? So you say you generated 60 leads. Well, out of six, let's do, let's do the numbers. I really like to dig in into the math of things, right? So 60 leads that, that month. And by the way, radio in itself is not going to solve your problem, right? You have to have the, in, the, the rest of the marketing to, um, um, to sort of align with the value propositions and, and offers you throw out on radio, right? People want to know you legit. The reputation has to be there, all those things, right? So um, let's do some numbers. 60 leads, and you said, and by the way, I'm just going to do it live here, so so forgive me here, but um, I want to dig in. 60 leads, and you said your closing ratio is, let's call it 20%. So 60 leads times 0.2, you closed 12 management contracts out of that, okay? 12 management contracts. The annual contract value for where you are, I would imagine, my guess, the annual contract value would be about 2300 bucks, 2400 bucks. That's not counting the placement, that's not counting the real estate sales opportunities, that's not counting other upsell opportunities. Well, then they count just straight up management fees and uh, uh, it's about 2,400. Um, well, actually, let's call that management fee plus, plus a placement fee average. So your annual contract value is 2,400 times 12. It's 28,800, okay? That's what you get out of the acquired accounts annually. Now you multiply that by four years, which is the average time your property management client would stay with you. you guys, stay with me so far. It's $115,000 in lifetime value. So you've closed in the month of November, last November, by spending $15,000 on radios and supplementing with other spend, like you working with four and a half, great. You have some content, you have reputation, you can close those deals, right? Now you spent, you, you, you produced 115,000 of minimum of a lifetime value in that one month. Why not keep doing it? Spend 15, get 115, right? Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense to me. That's how businesses operate. That's how I operate. Now you look at unit economics, you look at the acquisition cost, right? So that 15,000 plus, let's say a couple grand to four and a half, so that's 17,000. Uh, you spent 17000 to acquire 12 accounts. That's 1400 per account. I'll do it all day long, right? I'll do it all day long because you pay back this acquisition cost in six months, seven months maybe, okay? Financially, guys, this makes a lot of sense. This business is undervalued, and that's why, again, you see a lot of institutional dollars coming in here because it takes a, it's very cheap to acquire a customer that pays back in six months, eight months, just an unbelievable number for recurring revenue. You know, uh, I just came back from Australia, and to be absolutely clear, I've actually discussed this with a person who sold their company, and their multiple for buying a property management company is 40 to 50x. D does that make sense? 40 to 50x versus 12 to 15 we have here. Okay, so that's how much value the Australian entrepreneurs put on purchasing a portfolio. It could be four years times management fees, okay? And that is more aligned with the reality than what we have here. So, it, you know, going back to Steve and Brad, these guys get it, okay? These guys get it because acquiring those accounts are cheap. Yeah, it looks like you're taking money out of pocket to pay those kinds of huge acquisition costs. Oh my God, $1,400 to acquire a customer. Do the math. Know your numbers and continue to experiment, right? So, Monty, I, I, you know, I, I'd like to see you um, continue that sort of momentum with the radio and keep doing it. Yeah, it's expensive. Yeah, it's gonna initially bite. Yeah, it's gonna might put you in a cash flow jam. Then drop it down a little bit, but don't stop, right? Keep going. That revenue eventually will ca uh, catch up. There's a concept in uh, SaaS, software as a service. It's called SaaS desert, right? Because the SaaS revenue, the recurring revenue, which you guys are doing the same thing, I'll have you know, you have that recurring revenue. It, it's, it, it, uh, um, it scales up slowly, but when it does, it's that vertical sort of a shift where now all of a sudden you have thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars coming in every month. 
And now you can do a lot more things. So both Steve and, and Brad are in that realm. They've walked through the SaaS desert. We've had the hard conversations. Both of them, four and a half clients, have been four and a half clients and are it's to some extent continue to be because they continue to experiment and get things done. But they're well, well beyond most uh, uh, other firms out there who are still, who are just very wary of that desert because you know th the spend in the mind of a normal business owner does not equate to immediate gratification because it's a recurrent revenue. You have to look at it from an annual and a lifetime value perspective. Guys, this must be, you want to be Steve, you want to be Brad, or you just want to have a great profitable business. You need to understand that spending a thousand, even a two thousand dollars to acquire an account is nothing. It's cheap given that your rents are high enough, right? Of course, you got to you got to sort of understand that mathematics. Um, but, you know, besides just regular management fees, most of our my customers and most of property managers who sort of been doing it for a while have 40% of ancillary fees. 40% of the revenue comes from ancillary fees. So not only you get management fees, you get all these additional services, uh, value-add services or ancillary fees that you can earn additional money from. And especially if you have a sales division, and you help the investor acquire and exit the property, right, buy and sell, boy, I mean, we're talking about your portfolio being just a beginning of opportunities that you have for your business, but you have to build the portfolio first. You can't be a squirrel, right? So that, that was the, that's the internal. Internally, you have to be self-organized and understand that, look, I spend 10% of revenue, I acquire this many clients, this is my cost per acquisition, it's a go, go, go. Oh no, I'm spending way too much, the deals are not closing, or the customers are popping out, wrong quality, change the marketing channel. Or add additional marketing channels. Okay, so the next element is external. So the, the next question is how? Like, okay, Alex, I'm with you, I am willing to pay enough money to buy clients, I just need more of them. Well, fine. Three things that these guys are doing, nobody else is doing. Nobody else is doing at this velocity. Number one, content, okay? Each, each company that you mentioned, Monty, has well over 150, 200, 300 blogs that are basically just explainer videos that are talking to their prospects about managing a property and sharing their expertise, right? That's huge. That brings thousands, thousands upon thousands of, of visitors to the website. Then the next point is the website. Or, in fact, next point is reputation. Reputation, both of these guys are absolutely obsessed about reputation. They wake up in the morning. I bet you Steve Rosenberg checks his reviews. I bet you Brad wakes up in the morning, he has his coffee, comes to work, does his yoga. <laughs> And then he checks his Google rankings, right? Uh, that's just, these guys are, are figured out a, a way to get hundreds of positive reviews. You have to find a way for your happy clients to speak on your behalf. This is not rocket science. It needs to be solved. It's not easy. There are solutions like four and a half. We solve the reputation programmatically and customer experience. There are things you can do beyond that, right? This is not just, you just you don't just pay 200 bucks, 300 bucks a month and you say, okay, well, four and a half's got it for me. I don't have to do jack. No, you have to con commit to rewarding your employees, to have the culture of positivity and, and a culture of asking for reviews. That just has to be the case. And then together with that, with the programmatic solution, you have the people solution, you have the purpose, you know your numbers, and then you continue to experiment. And then you get your good reputation, hundreds of reviews. Blows everybody out of the water. And the last thing is the website. None of these guys have a cookie cutter website. Okay, you need a website that communicates and converts. I don't think Brad has a perfect website, nor do I think Steve's website is anywhere near perfect, but it's better than a lot of them out there because it's, it's, it's designed to communicate the, the extreme value propositions of these companies and how much they believe in their service. And it, it resonates, it resonates with the visitor. So, you know, hundreds of, hundreds of videos that are, true and just authentic explanations of what property management is all about, hundreds of reviews, 
and a good, well-designed website that communicates purpose and converts. Guys, that's what SEO is about these days. That's why both of these companies are on top of their respective searches. That is, that is it. That is, I think, their formula. However, I'm gonna, I might just actually, to follow up on this, if Steve and Brad are listening, I know Brad is listening, not sure about Steve, but if, if we can get both of these guys to talk about their strategies, I don't know if that will help you out, Monty, let me know, but uh, this is what I see from my position. Okay, um, we have time for one more question. This is uh, maybe maybe a couple more because this is a short, though I can get in into a uh, long discussion here. Um, comes from Matthew, a good friend from Rally. Uh, Matthew says, when someone says SEO won't save you, to what extent is that true? And in what way it is missing opportunity? That's a cryptic question. Thank you, Matthew. Appreciate that. SEO won't save you. Well, uh, I think this one, I'm just going to repeat <laughs> uh, my answer to the previous question. Um, internal, purpose, numbers, experimentation. You have to have the framework, right, for running your company and scaling your business. And external, which is content, reputation, and conversion, which is website. Okay, those those six things, so the internal three things for an external three things, those six, six things, if you do those right, you are a winner and SEO is um, going to enable all that, right? SEO, but SEO, what, the way I understand SEO is, is sitting there and plugging keywords and restructuring your website so it kind of corresponds and responds to the right keyword searches. Right, so in my opinion, SEO is just sort of a back-end website pfft, work that you know that engineers sort of a little bit of a infrastructure for Google to understand what your website is all about and serve the your website uh, on the first page for particular search terms. Okay, and so for that, SEO is an enabler, but if you don't have if your company is not aligned, right? People just kind of just there because you pay them paycheck and they can't find another job because they're, you know, let's face it, they're not that good. Um, you don't know your numbers. You don't track your KPIs. You don't understand what it costs you to acquire a customer. You don't know, um, you know, what your average revenue per customer is. You don't know um, where your leads are coming from. What is it costing you? And an operational side, you don't really track the numbers, track the numbers, and then, you are set in your ways in such a way that we've done this this way for a long time and we're going to continue doing it this way, right? No experimentation. That in itself, for that kind of company, SEO is not going to help you, right? You see, SEO is not going to help you because you're going to get them in and they're going to come right out, okay? Or you're going to get them in the door, you won't be able to close them because there's no continuity on the team. Right, nobody really cares. It's all sort of, we've always done this and blah, blah, blah. And the second piece is external, content, reputation, and conversion. Right, if you have hundreds of pieces of content that really authentically answer questions, you have great reputation, and your website converts like crazy, well, then again, SEO would enable that strategy. But in itself, without these core principles employed, in any small business, any growing business, any medium business, I don't care. I don't care if you don't want to grow. I do not care if you don't want to grow at all. But you know, it's a leaky bucket, right? You have to keep replacing properties as you lose them on the back end. And you want to bring more profitable, better owners, right? You want to kind of upgrade your portfolio. Well, for that, you have to, you have to market. You have to have the content. You have to have the reputation. You have to convert. And then internally, you have to understand what your purpose is, why, what you're fighting for, get your squad to fight with you and for you. Uh, you have to know your numbers and you have to experiment. And then, and then SEO makes huge impact for businesses like that, right? If you don't have any of these elements or only some, SEO will have some effect, okay? But I, I'm ho hopefully I'm answering the question. Um, I think we're about 33 minutes in. I think I might do one more. I'm gonna, I'm gonna roll here. So, um, one of the questions we we got, I got. I'm just kind of looking through him. Uh, 
Well, so this is a good one. Um, question came from uh, John at Minnesota. Yeah. Um, John says, why slash how would I spend money on marketing if I'm not growing? Well, many of you who just listened to the last 33 minutes of, uh, of my answers could probably pitch into answering this one, but you're not growing because you're not doing any marketing. You're not growing because your team is not aligned for growth. You have not communicated that as your purpose um, and part of your purpose. This could be a bypass. You, know, you, you said we need to grow passing by and looking you know, once a year or once every six months, looking at your numbers and saying, okay, well, we lost 30 properties. We've only gained six. We need to grow. Like that's not a purpose. That is a desperate uh, cry for help, right? And this just basically makes your team anxious instead of any solves anything. Growth happens to companies who are programmatically going after um, after this and, and, and including this in their purpose. Um, and they're structured internally and externally positioned for that growth, okay? So I would say if you're not growing, find a way to put the, the budget towards the acquisition rather than whatever other activities you currently have. Dude, that money is going somewhere. I mean, you're getting 20, 50, you know, $80,000 a month. Are you spending all that money on payroll? No. Okay, is that all that money go on software? No. Uh, so you pay yourself a salary. What happens with the rest? What, what, what part of your revenue is dedicated to growth? Oh, none? Oh, well, if none is dedicated, none is the outcome. That is how businesses operate, guys. I just want to say that, look, it's, it's hard truth, and I'm not speaking easy truth here. Running a business is difficult, painful, and it's very lonely, okay? You have nobody to complain to. Uh, you have to make decisions and solve problems. Be unpopular in a lot of times in order to save the organization, save the company, save a critical customer, um, you know, find a good, uh, good fit, you know, continue to experiment. It's just so many things. It's a lot easier to do things the way we've always done. That is... That is sort of the, the definition of, of an easy, easy life as an entrepreneur, okay? We have the systems in place, you know, we have the people who've been with me for 40 years, 20 years, we're just going to keep on chugging along. It worked before, it, uh, it's odd to work still, and that is simply not true. That is simply not true in most cases, and, you know, that's fine, um, this is, this show is designed for businesses that are looking to improve and grow and continuously add value to the constituents that they service. Um, and if you're listening, you're definitely in that category. And I'm sorry if I am being harsh, but I see a lot of this sort of, um, um, this, this um, kind of peaky, peak and valleys in terms of uh, oh, I want to grow. We have to do it. We need to. We need to get this done. This is mu a must. We lost all these properties. We have to gain them back. We we need to. Let's sign up with four and a half. Let's get everybody on board. Let's get everything, and then it fizzles out in sixty days, and you know nobody picks up the phone, and you know nobody really cares. There's no owner to this program, so you know your outsource marketing is not gonna, you know, it's not gonna solve this without you. Right? However you hire, you know, as an example, at the PM Growth Summit, um, you know, you see all these ads running around, right? So we, this is our conference, right? Um, you see all these ads running around on Facebook. You're going to get a mailer. Uh, we have all these deals. We have tons of content on PMGrowthSummit.com. Tons of content. And how do you think that comes out? And we have an amazing reputation, by the way. You know, we, we've Early on, the first conference, we captured a lot of reviews. All of that is on pmgrowsummit.com. But th this just doesn't happen. Uh, we spend thousands, in fact, up to seven, 
five to seven to eight thousand dollars a month on marketing, guys. And we've brought in a marketing company that specializes in the event. Uh, one of their specialties is the event field, right? So you know, I'm not even taking my own marketing company and trying to sort of fit our property management marketing experience into an event experience, trying to make that work. We hired a company, and it, it's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. I have to, you know, I have to uh, segment the lists. I have to approve the creative. We have to strategize on how that mailer is going to look like. There's just so many different things that Jordan and I have to be involved in in order to make this work that it's mind-boggling. Okay, and and it, so it's not marketing is not a set it and forget it forget it solution. It's not we've always done it. We're going to continue to do it. It's constant state of experimentation. Okay, you have to find a partner, whoever that may be, and you have to invest time in this. This is not just going to be solved. People will say, well, I've hired this company, and, and when we get on the call, I'll have somebody um, tell me, well, Alex, we hired this marketing company six months ago, and we have zero results. My first question is, so let's talk about it. What have you done over that last six months, and what was the premise that you hired the company under? Like, I want to understand what that experience was, and it really is that marketing company dropped the ball, or it's you, the business owner, who dropped the ball. And this is indicative of our relationship. I don't need people who don't commit to doing this together, right? If they're not interested in growing, they're just interested in putting a check mark into the growth and sending the check, that is not the customer that's gonna be, that, that's gonna be successful. I already know that. I already know that. I see that right away. So it's very important to understand that all of these, uh, that anything growth related is, is, is effort, is experimentation, is investment, okay? And the, the guys, the companies I mentioned earlier in Monty's question, Empire Industries and Larson Properties, which is Rentworks now, they have figured that out. They have figured that out, but they're not stopping at just saying, okay, now we have the system. Let's just continue doing that. They're continually experiment. And I encourage you to listen to Brad's podcast. You'll get, you gain a lot of knowledge out of that. And I think it's, it's called, uh, what is it called? The property management mastermind. There we go. Sorry, Brad. Didn't recall that right off the bat. Um, and, and gain some uh, knowledge out of that. So, um, guys, anyway, this was, um, hopefully this was helpful. If you have questions, and again, I apologize to the audience for speaking harshly, but it is from the bottom of my heart to help you progress and move to the direction you want, you have to take these steps. You have to understand what your purpose is and align the team behind it. You have to know your numbers, track everything, obsess over everything. And you have to be absolutely cu the culture of experimentation on the outside. That's on the internal. On the external, you have to do tons of content. You have to be obsessed about re your reputation, obsessed about your reputation. And you have to website. You have to have a website that converts, that's unique, that is ex explosive, and it expresses who you are as a company, what your beliefs are. That's the winning formula, guys. Anyway, I thank you very much for listening. And let me know. Please email me at alex at four and a half. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll do another QA show um, over the next uh, month or so. So send me your uh, send me your questions. And again, thanks a lot for listening. Until next time. <music>